Coming up, it's the origin story of one of rock's greatest drummers, in my opinion, the greatest ever, and how a failed pilgrimage to England brought him face to face with destiny, namely a force of nature who defined classic rock excellence forever. After returning to his Canadian hometown, he auditioned for a really incredible band, but he felt like the audition was a complete disaster. Uh, proof that first impressions aren't always accurate, especially in rock and roll, because uh, he turned the disaster into the final step, final piece of a, a musical puzzle. He also became the preeminent drummer, lyricist on this planet. Coming up, the legend of the rise of the great one, and a song that's now a 70s standard that paid tribute to his, his struggle to find his place is coming up next. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the, the sequencing of your favorite albums, you know, song by song, even though everything has now turned to playlists, you're going to dig this channel. This is what we celebrate. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Hit the big red button. Check the box. You always get our latest interviews and stories. Click the little notification thing, all that jazz. We also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out. Uh, we're posting exclusive content from our live stuff. You can also check out our Vintage Years collection, celebrating a great year in music by rap fink artist Thomas Estrada. So it's time to tell the tale of how a mere mortal became Earth's mightiest drummer uh, with the power of a thousand men and completed one of history's definitive prog rock bands, the triumphant trio of Rush. We're going to discuss the criminally shortchanged Fly By Night today. Fly by night away from here. My life again. Now, the story of Fly By Night really begins and ends with the late, great Neil Peart. Born in Hamilton, Ontario, his family later moved to nearby St. Catharines. There, Neil began taking drum lessons uh, at age 13. Throughout his teens, he played with a succession of local bands, you know, honing his skills in basements, garages, church halls, high schools, and also skating rinks. By the time he was 18, Neil was ready to chase his dream of rock and roll glory as a professional drummer in England. Uh, for Peart, uh, England was a destination of mythic status. This was where Cream, and the Yardbirds, and the Who were born and raised. It was where progressive rock bands like Yes, King Crimson, and Genesis wrote the prologue to the burgeoning genre. So in July of 1971, Peart followed his muse across the Atlantic, leaving behind his small town, uh, his Canadian life. Peart built a crate for his drums. He packed up his record collection, of course, and he set off for England. He had about 200 bucks in his pocket. After arriving, he roomed with a friend and the fellow Canadian, Brad French, you know, sleeping on his couch. Neil recalls, I went to England searching for fame and fortune. The first thing I did when I got over there was get auditions out of the back of Melody Maker and the other music papers. A lot of people back in the day did that. The only problem was none of these auditions really panned out. So hitting the pavement, he knocked the doors of record labels only to be repeatedly turned away. No one was interested in this unknown Canadian import. Although Neil did manage to land a few gigs, he didn't make enough to pay the bills. And this led to a life of relative poverty, and often he actually went hungry. At one point, Peart did land a spot in a band that was called English Rose. However, he soon discovered his bandmates were essentially reprobates who stole their gear and they had a penchant for getting into a lot of trouble. And to make matters worse, they weren't any good. The gigs dried up and so did Peart's cash flow at that point. Neil recalls, I was soon getting disillusioned over uh, at this place by the music industry, realizing it wasn't the way that I thought it was. You didn't just get really good at the music you loved and become successful. I also made the decision, well, if I can't make a living playing the music I like, then I'll make a living some other way and still play the music that I like. In all, Peart spent 18 months in England with nothing but hard knock experiences to show for it. So, you know, he returned home to Ontario and he went to work with uh, his father at a farm equipment company. In his off time, he played the club scene with a bar band that was actually called Hush. Just one letter removed from destiny. By this point, Rush, you know, they of course already been a band for years. They formed in Toronto in 1968. You know, after teenage friends Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee started playing together. In those early days, Rush would have something of a rotating lineup and 
Up through their first album, it was actually John Rutsey on drums. However, Rutsey suffered from type 1 diabetes, and uh, living the life of a rocker was at odds with the disease. Said Getty, Rutsey's health was really bad. He was running himself right into the ground. Now, the type of schedule we had is rough on a healthy person. He was really suffering from having to play so hard so often. Alex and I have always moved in the same musical direction, and he was growing in a different way. I knew, or I think we all knew, that it was eventually going to happen. Rutsey played his last gig with the band on uh, July 25th, 1974, at Centennial Hall in London, Ontario. Uh, the band was in need of a new drummer, of course. Enter Hush drummer Neil Peart. Actually, three drummers got an invitation to try out. The first went nowhere. Uh, the guys did like the second, but he wasn't skilled enough. And then there was Neil Peart. Initially, he was hesitant to try out since he already had a band. But after some serious consideration, he decided, you know, to see what would come of it. Peart has since described the audition as a complete disaster. A Getty has since said that Neil looked like a grease ball when he showed up. You know, he had this submariner hairstyle and a small, funky drum kit. But the guys jammed for about 40 minutes, and there was no denying that Neil Peart was really good. He was really good. Getty and Neil, they hit it off pretty quick. However, Alex was skeptical, and he later admitted he didn't think the Brainiac drummer was cool enough to be in their band. Now, thankfully, Lee talked Lifeson into it. Peart officially joined Rush on uh, July 29, 1974, red later date there. Two weeks later, he played his first gig with the band in front of 11,000 people at Pittsburgh Civic Arena. It was the largest crowd the trio had experienced by far at that point. <laughs> The show kicked off Rush's first U.S. tour in which they opened for uh, Manford Man and Uriah Heep. Now, according to Getty, the arrival of Peart sealed the deal for the band's prog rock ambitions. He and Alex were already starting to write more complex stuff. And Neil coming into the band was a, a kind of confirming final piece of that puzzle. He liked to play things that were difficult, and that was the direction that Alex and Getty were moving in, as I was saying before. With Peart firmly entrenched in the band, Rush returned to the studio for their sophomore LP, Fly By Night. It was recorded at Toronto Sound Studios in January 1975 and would be released the following month uh, on February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day. <laughs> Uh, Fly By Night was the first Rush album to showcase elements of progressive rock for which they would become known. And since neither Lifeson nor Lee had any interest in being lyricists, Peart became the, the rare drummer to take up that mantle. Said Neil Peart, I never thought seriously about writing lyrics until I joined this band, and it became a necessity because no one else was doing it. I'm an avid reader, though actually I'm a high school dropout, but I've educated myself. I love that. Greatest drummer ever, and he's a dropout. That's how it should be. So Peart put his self-educated intellect to work from there, and what emerged was a writing style influenced by dystopian science fiction and fantasy literature. It would become an essential component of the band's trademark sound. In one year, Rush went from you know, basic rock lyrics to fantasy numbers like By Tour and The Snow Dog. As we continue to break down this classic by one of the world's greatest bands, I do want to thank our awesome sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Tell you, my favorite brand of glasses ever. Make sure that you click on the link below to go to Zenny and shop by shape, color, and style, all different kinds of fashions to create your best look for less than the price of a vinyl record. Zenny. Also, check out their new app. Very cool. The songs that landed on Fly By Night were written mostly on the road in you know, cramped cars and low-budget hotels or even motels or sound check jam sessions. Uh, Neil remembered that Alex would have an acoustic guitar and they'd be working on songs after shows, you know, wherever they could. He wrote down each city or the cities that all these songs were written in, and you know, they were all over the map. According to Neil, it was all very ad hoc. 
which uh, actually made the title of the album you know, that much more appropriate since everything was conceived on the fly. Alex remembered the making of Fly By Night being a very busy time. They just finished the first leg of a US tour and had been on the road from August to 74 up to Christmas. He said, we went in one morning and recorded the record through the five day period, finishing mixing at about three or four o'clock in the morning and packed up and went directly to the airport for an 8 a.m. flight to do a, a gig in Winnipeg. So we basically had no time off. I mean, that's just an incredible schedule to, to, to keep. Upon its completion, though, Fly By Night found the guys going well beyond what established bands have been doing within the bounds of, of hard rock and rock and roll. They were purposely combining the art rock brilliance of yes. I'll be the roundabout. And King Crimson. Genesis. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. With proto-metal guitar work. They had, in effect, created a whole new genre. Progressive metal. That's where it was born. Alongside songs such as the heavy-hitting dystopian anthem, The eight minute, eight section by tour and the snow dog. And the Lord of the Rings inspired ballad Rivendell. Fly by Night also included a, a solitary self titled single that we're going to talk about today, the featured song. Reflecting on the record in 75, Getty Lee said, We're very happy with it. We recorded it as an album. You know, singles would be nice, but that's incidental. <laughs> However, Fly By Night would not be incidental. Fly By Night, away from here. Change my life again. Fly By Night is actually the first song the band wrote together. It came together during a three-day break in East Lansing, Michigan. Although some fans consider Anthem to be the first, it was technically already in its infancy before Neil joined the band. Peard also has said that the lyrics for Fly By Night were some of the first he submitted to Alex and Getty for consideration for the album. Fly By Night and a few other of the first songs with lyrics written by Neil made an appearance before the second album was recorded in a New York City radio concert. This was at the tail end of 1974. In this concert though, Fly By Night was very different. By tour and the Snow Dog was actually tacked on to its end. But by the time it reached its final incarnation, it did take on a very different form. And uh, it's basically the most pop like piece on this album. <music> Thematically, uh, Fly By Night projects a feel of being suspended between two places. It's about that moment of limbo and reflection before transitioning into something greater. Getty Lee and Neil Peart are both credited as the songwriters on the track, but from a lyrical standpoint, it's all about Neil Peart, written both by and about him. Fly By Night zeroes in on Neil's formative flight to England to search out uh, his rock and roll glory. However, because Peart does well to couch the experience in more universal terms, the song feels relatable to just about anyone who's tried to start a new chapter in their life. When Peart discussed uh, how he wrote lyrics, he said, and I quote, in simple terms, those early big pieces were driven by ambition. I was grappling with big metaphorical themes and sweeping allegories. And it's another mirror of personal development too. Start out with the grand principles and idealistic dreams then gradually move on to more concrete, real-life applications of those principles and ideals." End of quote. Fly By Night opens with Peart tackling his doubts and his dreams in real life. On a transatlantic flight, uh, why try? I know why. The feeling inside of me says it's time I was gone. He then makes his ambition clear. Neil is in search of greatness. He wants to be a king, not just one more pawn. Peart 
Pierre also describes a telling moment as he sits on the plane, you know, staring at his own reflection in the window. He sees no fear in his face. He's confident in where he's going, what he's doing. There's no looking back, there's no turning back. Reportedly, Neil also wrote a short prologue to the piece that wasn't used in the song. Describes the human chaos in the airport before embarking on this flight. Airport scurry, flurry faces, parade of passers-by. And also how time seems to stand still as he waits to board the plane. Another cigarette, get in line, gate 39, the time is not here yet. Though it may have uh, made an interesting addition, feels like it would have kind of watered down the song's overall theme to me. But very cool insight. Should also mention Fly By Night's influence on the name of the album and his cover art. Peart recalled that when it was time to put the, the album together, Fly By Night just seemed like the best title. They had also considered Aurora Borelius, but uh, Neil considered that an inferior choice, really. Since he was a kid, he had been a bird lover, and he remembered this illustration of a swooping snowy owl with fierce eyes. He suggested an image like that for the cover, and you know everybody really liked the idea. Fly By Night was also one of two songs that received a promo video from the album. Uh, Anthem was, of course, the other. These two videos are often referred to as the church session videos. At the time, the key difference between a music video and other performance footage was intent. Now, music videos were created solely for promotional purposes. Uh, rarely do they show the band actually playing live, and if they do, the live audio is often replaced with the studio recording, as you, you know. Both songs were clearly recorded on a soundstage, with the band actually playing and singing live. The live music was undoubtedly replaced by the album versions of the songs. Uh, I can't imagine Rush ever lip syncing. Both videos are understandably popular within the Rush fan base, especially with the first generation fans who connected with the band in the 70s, the originals. Fly By Night was initially released as a single in May of 75, and uh, at that time it did reach number 45 in Canada, but it didn't break into the US charts. December of 76, the song was released as a single a second time in a live medley with uh, In The Mood from Rush's live album, All The World's A Stage. This version became the band's first single to chart in the Billboard Hot 100. It uh, kind of snuck in there at number 88. Now, since its release, Fly By Night has had a small number of media placements, including the Grassy High in 91, a Canadian show there, uh, Supernatural in 2005, and I Love You Man in 2009. Great, great uh, rendition there. It was also one of a handful of Rush songs made available to download for Rock Band 3. And in 2012, it was used as the centerpiece of an entertaining Volkswagen commercial. Fly By Night has also been covered by uh, Candlebox that happened in 94, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in 2012, and the Bare Naked Ladies did it in 2013. This is definitely a song that deserves so much more recognition. January 7th, 2020, of course, uh, we lost the great Neil Peart. To me, he was the, the revered god of the drum solo. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Peart was comparatively different from other rock drummers because his drum solos were not uh, bombastic displays of self-indulgence. There were complex musical arrangements with unconventional patterns and, and time signatures. Not only a phenomenal lyricist, Neil created his own style that was so difficult to emulate that most of his peers would just shake their heads in disbelief the sounds that he could create out of thin air, essentially. And I have to say that uh, this is where my grudge against the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame really started. Not only did they fail to induct Rush in their first year of eligibility, but it took them well over a decade. It's just pure and utter blasphemy. 
finally induct Rush into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I still maintain that Rush, the greatest trio in history, with apologies to the police, and Neil Peart and his work on Fly By Night is as great a reason as any of the other millions of reasons why. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Rush and Fly By Night. What do you remember about this song? What do you think about this band? Are they the greatest trio ever? What is your favorite song and album by Rush? Really, Rush, they're an albums band. Don't forget to subscribe below if you like this video so that you never miss any of our content. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords, have a truth.